Thank you guys, first of all, for joining us this afternoon. Um, uh, today, what we're going to talk about and how I break down my pruning when I think about pruning in the landscape primarily. Uh, there's also pruning in the orchard. It's much more special, specialized. I may touch on that at a couple points in the presentation because that deals with fruit. It's a little different. Uh, I will touch on it every now and again, but primarily I'll talk about landscape and ornamental plants and uh, plants that are grown for foliage and plants that uh, you prune based on bloom. So that's some major kind of breakdowns of how I do the presentation. We'll start out with trees first, and then we'll go into shrubs. I don't think trees uh, the, is quite as fun as shrubs. shrubs. Shrubs are a little bit more diverse, and they have a little bit more going on, but I, trees are important too in our landscapes. And even if you don't plan on pruning trees yourself, I think that it helps homeowners be informed so that when they're selecting an arborist, for someone to come in and prune landscape plants like trees, the more you know, the better off and the better results you'll get because uh, the quality of folks that you work with may vary greatly and I'll just leave it at that. But when I think about pruning trees and shrubs in my mind, this is how I break it down here on this slide. Usually what we're doing as homeowners uh, or even in commercial landscapes is we're worried about growth control. Now nothing is going to fix a red maple planted four feet from a home. Nothing's ever gonna fix that issue. No amount of pruning, no amount of work's gonna fix that. So part of it is plant selection. But when we think about pruning trees and shrubs, a lot of it is growth control. And then I think about water sprouts and, and what they mean for the plant and when and how we can prune those off. And when I look at plants, I further break it down by am I thinning out the plant? making cuts all the way back to um, the ground or to a, a branch. Are we thinning a plant or are we heading back a plant? The most common example of heading back a plant would be shearing like a boxwood or a taxis or you. That's a type of heading back cut. So growth control, we'll talk a lot about that. Water sprouts, thinning and heading back. Just think about those things. That's how I break down my pruning trees and shrubs presentation. Start out with uh, talking about pruning trees. Why are trees pruned? Once again, it's most common we prune them to control the plant size and to a lesser extent form. Now we have to be careful here about trying to change the overall form of a plant. If you can imagine in your mind a plant that has a strong natural form or shape, something like a Bradford pear, you're not going to try to force that Bradford pear typically to be anything more than it's kind of globe top shape. You're not going to do that. Or a pin oak. A pin oak's going to have a pyramidal shape and we're not really going to be able to offer that effectively. And if you try to do that, it's probably going to cause some problems uh, in the long term. So to control plant size and form. Uh, sometimes we prune to enhance flowering and fruiting. Now we'll talk a lot about pruning plants based on flowering. And what I say about pruning trees and shrubs is going to be the same. Uh, the principles of when you're pruning a plant based on flowering is going to be the same for both. Some plants obviously are not valued for flowering, so we don't worry about those. The principles are a little bit more broad and a little bit more general. But if we value a plant, a tree or shrub for flowering, it gets pretty specific. Sometimes we prune to rejuvenate old trees. And the most common example of rejuvenation that I have here in my own county, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I think about old fruit trees. I told you we were not gonna talk about fruit trees a lot, and here I have pictures of blueberries, and I've already just started talking about fruit trees, but uh, rejuvenating old apple trees, that's something that we get several calls a year on, so sometimes we prune to rejuvenate. When we first put a tree in the ground, we probably prune to train more than we do anything else, because the, the pruning cut, the pruning and training that you'll do the first three years of a new tree's life is going to have the biggest impact. It's going to have a bigger impact than more than anything else you're going to do to that tree. And that's the first three years of that tree's life. And I'll give you an example. Uh, red maple is a tree that I see so many times. They're planted in the ground and they have multiple stems. And that's not really desirable at all for red maples. And, and, and folks let them grow into multi leadered multi stem trees. And that's not nearly as good as if that person during the first three years of 
three years of that tree's life had pruned to one central leader, that tree would have been much stronger and probably had a longer life. But that's just one example. But pruning it, uh, transplanting is also a common type of pruning that I think personally is more important than anything else in this presentation is that pruning you do at transplanting. Once again, the characteristic form of the tree should be researched. You should understand what the mature tree is going to look like. If it's a white pine, it's going to have a certain shape. If it's a maple, it's going to have a certain shape. And you're going to have to accept that for the most part. You shouldn't try to change the overall form of the tree. Let's talk about some general rules of thumb because so, many, so much of my presentation, I try to stick to the big kind of plant concepts, the big rules of thumbs, because if you have those down, it'll give you a good kind of framework to think about pruning trees and shrubs. Well, let's talk a little bit about closure or callousing. What a lot of us call you know, wound healing, it's not really healing, it's more kind of the plant compartmentalizing or closing off wounds. Just remember that when you make pruning cuts, the most rapid growth is during the springtime. So what that means for me is that that's a good time to do a lot of your pruning chores is in the early spring, depending on when the tree or shrub blooms, because that's when the most rapid callousing or closure or compartmentalization takes place. And it looks nicer if you do it during the spring and it kind of prohibits insects and decay from getting uh, started inside the plant. So a lot of my pruning I, drew, I do, especially on landscape trees, is in the springtime. And this is usually if I was doing a live presentation, somebody would stop me and say, what about my maples? It's going to drip all over my cars. Do I prune those early spring too? No, you can wait just a little bit on those and we'll talk about that just a little bit later on in the presentation about the tree bleeders that uh, that produce a lot of sap and and if you prune those early in the the year it'll cause you some trouble especially if they're around um, vehicle stuff like that around home they make a mess a little bit about pruning branches just remember the smaller the branch is when it's removed the more rapid the closure of the wound that's important if you make a huge pruning cut let's say a six eight inch branch in a tree that's obviously gonna heal uh, slower than if you had pruned a one to two inch branch. So it's good to, to make those early pruning cuts. Remember I said the first three years of training and pruning of a tree's life is most important. It's because those branches are small and you can make huge changes in the scaffold limbs of a tree when the limbs are small and they heal up very quickly and almost become invisible as wounds. A rule of thumb is only remove about one third or less of a total plant's leaf mass at a time. If we're talking about uh, mature trees, I would go much less than that. If it's a very large tree, I would not remove nearly a third. But the smaller the plants are, especially landscape shrubs, you can usually remove a third of smaller plants without having the plant having a big response of regrowth. But if it's a large tree, remove far less than that, more like a fifth or a quarter, something like that at most, and that's an extreme case. We typically would never remove 25% of a uh, the top of a tree unless it was an extreme situation. A little bit of, when I look up into trees and I do a lot of uh, tree assessments on our uh, local horse farms here in Bourbon County, we're in horse country here in Central Kentucky, and I get a lot of phone calls to do safety assessments, and when I look up into a tree, here's kind of the order of things that I look for and things for you to look for at home. The first thing I look for is dead branches. I look for these branches especially if it's close to a house, a barn, if it's in a park. I've looked at a lot of trees lately, did safety assessments, and the first thing I look for is dead branches. Those need to come out simply because they're a safety hazard. The next thing I look for is broken branches, which are soon to be dead branches, but with all the ice storms we had several years ago, it's amazing how much of these uh, hinged branches I look up and see in trees. I still see a lot of limbs and some of them even leaf out, especially on the maples. It's amazing, a maple can leaf out and still be almost completely broken, have a limb that's completely broken, it'll have green leaves on it. But the next thing I look for are these hinged branches. But broken branches is the next thing I look for. After that, it's not so much a safety uh, issue uh, like broken branches, but I look for tree stubs. It's more of a, now we're getting into plant health, 
uh, I look for stubs. This is a stub here, and it's obviously someone's not paid attention to where they made a pruning cut, and they had a dead, they got a huge dead column of wood all the way back to a growing point, this main branch here. And here are some more stubs. So when I'm looking for overall factors of tree health, that's the third thing I look for are stubs, and I remove any stubs. And now you as homeowners, if you're pruning at home, I know you're not going to leave any stubs. It's somebody else's poor craftsmanship that left those. I know you guys will never do that, especially after this presentation. So look for stubs. And uh, the next thing I look for is insect and disease problems within a tree. Now this is where I would encourage you guys, if you have a disease like fire blight or, or something that's pretty common in the ornamentals, if you have, have an insect or disease problem, the first thing you have to do is not prune. The first thing you need to do is uh, call the extension office if you don't know what disease or insect you're having issues with and have the problem identified so that you can prune at the correct time. And I say that for this reason, there are certain diseases that um, you prune at certain times of the year. The same goes for insect damage. Uh, but it's very specific on a lot of these diseases. In fact, if you're not careful, you can prune uh, your tree, you can prune off the dead because it looks bad and end up spreading a disease and making it much worse either that year or the next year. So find out exactly what insect and what disease you're dealing with before you ever prune because there may be specific requirements to contain the problem if possible. Uh, the next thing after uh, diseases and insect problems that I look for is uh, any branches that are too close together, especially those branches that are crossing over one another or rubbing. And once again, that's a, that's a plant health issue. If branches are stacked that closely together, they're not going to get adequate sunlight, first of all. Second of all, if they're rubbing, physically rubbing together, they're creating a wound. And when we have wounds, that's an easy place for pathogens and insects to get into, and that's not a good situation. So, and that's way, way, that's even more important when we're talking about uh, shrubs, because if you think about a shrub versus a tree, typically shrubs can be much, much more dense as far as branching goes. They can be much more dense than a tree. But the next thing I look for is crossing or rubbing branches. Anything that's that close together, stacked that close together, I tend to select one of those and remove those. And if you have branches, once again, here's an example of uh, two branches rubbing together. They're creating wounds there. I will select one of those branches and remove it. Typically, I'll take um, the, the branch that's a little um, uh, less well-formed and remove that branch. And we'll talk about how to go through that thinking process here in just a second. So that, that's my next thing that I look for are, is those crossing and rubbing branches. They don't need, branches don't need to be typically that close together in most deciduous trees especially, and they definitely shouldn't be rubbing together. Uh, next, let's talk just a second about root suckers. I see uh, this situation quite often because people are afraid that it's a detriment to the plant if you remove root suckers, and it typically is not, and you can remove those just about any time. I would prefer root suckers that's coming up around the base of the tree to be removed before they get this extensive. That's extensive root suckers. Not only does it look bad, where's the energy going in that plant? A lot of these root suckers are taking up energy that should be going into the parent plant. So it's an undesirable situation, situation in most cases, unless you are trying to propagate a plant or something like that or have specific reasons. This is, for the most part, undesirable, having all these root suckers. The next thing we'll talk about just for a second is water sprouts. Now, water sprout is different than a root sucker in that water sprouts are these little one-year-old whips. And you'll find water sprouts in a couple scenarios. You'll find a lot of water sprouts in a couple scenarios. The first one is if you drastically pruned a tree, one of the typical responses of a tree is to send up a lot of water sprouts because you have put the, the tree in a traumatic situation, so it has hormones in it that initiates all this branching to, to, to reproduce the branches that have been taken out. So that's one scenario that we see a lot of water sprouts. Or if the tree is just not growing well or has some other functional problem, some sort of health related problem, we'll see water sprouts in that scenario. And a situation comes to mind of something like a, uh, an ash tree that uh, has borer issues. One of the things we look for is a lot of these little water sprouts. It's not always an indication of a disease, but it can be. Um, 
whatever scenario you have, if you have landscape trees and they have a, a lot of water sprouts in there, that's undesirable because it causes crowding. And we talked about what crowded branches do. They, they rob each other of sunlight, they rub together, cause a lot of issues. And we don't need that. And those can be removed just about any time during the year that the wood's not frozen. But water sprouts, we don't want a lot of those in there in a lot of cases because it, it just makes the, the tree too thick. And the last thing uh, is convenience, uh, especially this goes true if you live in a uh, subdivision or if I'm working with parks, the last thing that I consider is just pure convenience. It's not a decision based on tree health. It's a decision based on uh, the function of that tree in the landscape. And that's just, if I have to mow around a tree and a limb keeps smacking me in the face, I may decide to cut that limb off. Not because it'll make the tree healthier, but it'll make me happier. And that's pruning based on convenience. And this is a big deal in park systems, especially on sidewalks here. You don't want low lying limbs here. They would obviously, you know, disrupt traffic flow on that sidewalk. And you'll notice that the limbs here have been pruned up six, eight feet uh, well above head level. A really, really important concept is on this page. And that's, let's, uh, here we're gonna to start to talk about making specific pruning cuts. I want you to kind of look at the, the, uh, the diagram here closely. You'll see a swollen area on this tree. Now I picked this tree because it's nice and smooth and we can really see this swollen area here, the bark branch ridge and the branch collar. Those two things make up this swollen area. And this area is kind of unique in trees in that it has <clears throat> specialized cells that aren't found anywhere else in plants besides this area here. And if you cut those cells off, if you were to flush cut that limb there, what do you think would happen without those specialized cells that tell the tree to callus off or compartmentalize off once you cut that limb? If you don't have those cells telling the tree to kind of close that wound, the wound's not gonna close. So never cut into this swollen area. We're lucky with this picture here, it's very easy to see the swollen area. The branch collar, we can easily see it. <clears throat> and I would make the pruning cut here without getting into that. And that's a smaller limb. We've cut outside the branch collar, so it should heal very rapidly, especially if we've made that cut in the spring. Let's talk for a second that we just looked at a smaller example of a limb. That's the easy ones. <clears throat> Let's talk about removing larger limbs. How many of you all have ever seen this scenario where someone's coming in, this is an eight or 10 inch limb, it's a big limb that was removed for whatever reason. They made a single cut and as that <clears throat> large limb, that large portion of tree started to hinge down, it stripped part of the bark. And that's never going to properly heal. In most situations, it will not heal. And everything we talk about in the next minute or two is going to be on how to avoid this. Here's uh, another picture of damage to the bark branch, collar, or ridge. You'll see it's looking pretty good there, not too bad. I believe this is a calorie, calorie repair, but once again, one single cut was made, <clears throat> a simple cut and that limb started to hinge down and rip that uh, bark branch ridge and caused a big wound heal here. And now that's starting to heal, but it's still very tough. The plant uses up more energy and it's slower to heal. We don't, that's an undesirable situation. We're gonna to try to avoid that. And how we're going to avoid that is this cut on this page, the ABC cut, it's the three-fold cut, and I use it for any <clears throat> larger limbs. The first cut that I make is the cut here. Now, this is usually when I'm doing the presentation live, somebody says, but you're leaving a stub, you know, because you make your final cut here. Well, no, that's our third cut. Our first cut starts here. The second cut we make here. And why do we do that? As that limb starts to hinge down, if it starts to strip bark here, the bark starts, starts to strip and then ends here. What you're doing is protecting this area from this limb falling and starting to strip bark and peeling bark all the way down the tree. That's what, that's the whole point of this point, this cut A. So make your first cut, someone's out on the limb six, eight inches, make your second cut here. Your third cut is your cleanup cut, your final cut, and you make it at the proper location at the, the collar, the bark, the branch collar. So that's a three point cut, that's very important. You may have an occasion to use that, or if you're working with someone else, you can make sure they know to use that. 
they'll do a better job pruning large limb from your large limbs from your trees. The next thing I leave, this has to do a lot with tree safety and limb selection, but what to prune? U shaped uh, crotches in, in, in trees versus V shaped. This is a big concept for me, one of the biggest in trees. U versus V shaped. Let's uh, demonstrate that a little bit. Here's some examples of V shaped crotches. And by that, what I mean is this angle here is pretty severe. The limb is growing straight, almost straight up compared to the main leader, what I'm assuming is the main leader of the tree. This is a little bit better picture. The main trunk of the tree, and here's a limb that's growing up. This is a V shape. That's not desirable. We want more of a U shape, something like this with a greater angle here. This limb doesn't grow straight up, it grows more out. For most species of trees, that's much, much more desirable. It's important to note here that if we're talking about something like a Bradford pear, if you ever look at those really closely, you'll notice that almost every limb looks like this. They're growing straight up because that's the nature of the growth of a pear tree. That's one of the reasons we see those split out so much is they have V-shaped crotch angles. You have, you have, these are weak just by their very nature. And we'll talk about why they're weak in a second. They're just weak. If you cross cut a V-shaped limb, you'll see that it has embedded bark here. And all that is very weak. This is this limb cut down the center and it's very weak. All of that is just open to the elements and that's rot. That's why they're very weak. And you'll see it in a lot of trees like your red maples, um, Acer rubrum, uh, trees like that. They'll not naturally kind of have that and it's part of the species. And that's why training is so important. This is a red maple that should have had one main trunk growing instead of two. And that was part of a training failure the first three years of that plant being in the ground. Here's another picture of bark. I showed you a picture of that cross section a second ago. Here's rot on those V-shaped angles. You'll see rot go way down into the tree. Pretty common, rot and decay. And once again, that's a red maple. Here's a uh, London plane tree, or is this, this is the Bradford pear. It shows that rot column. Once again, those uh, V-shaped uh, branch angles, they let in a lot of rot. That's why they're so weak. How do you prune those? You can't prune those in a standard way. Uh, what I would suggest, uh, this being the main trunk of the tree, this is just an example, is that you do the best you can. You wouldn't prune all the way down there. You would just make the pruning cut here and do the best you can. You can't make a standard cut. You have to kind of be creative. Uh, so that cut was kind of made straight across there, it's a little trickier to prune the V-shaped the angles, it really is. Here's a tree with more of a U-shaped branch union. These are, these. Are, some people would argue that could possibly be a V-shape. I don't call it a V-shape because I look at this area. I don't see that there's included bark that we saw in earlier slides. I don't think there's a lot of opening for rock to get down in there. So to me, that's more U-shaped. Here is a cross section of a U-shaped branch angle. Here's why they are much, much stronger. You'll see the U-shape here. Is there any rod here? Absolutely not. U-shaped um, branch angles don't have that bark that gets down in there, so they're, they're stronger to begin with, much, much stronger. A little bit about wound dressings. The only say, thing I'll say about this slide is they don't really aid in wound closure, and I typically recommend against them. In fact, they can trap water, moisture, provide a hiding place for insects, and actually cause more problems than they solve. So with room dressings, uh, since they don't aid in the, the wound closure process, if you've made a, a proper pruning cut, I don't recommend them. Uh, topping, I can summarize this very quickly. Don't do it. If you automatically shorten the life of your tree, if you uh, hat rack, some people call it hat racking, heading back. It's not really heading back because that's a proper pruning method. Um, but this was just indiscriminately uh, topped back. The top of the tree was almost completely removed and you've automatically reduced the total functional life of that tree for these reasons. You remove a lot of tissue that results in removal of buds and leaves, which provides energy for the plant. You have a lot of large wounds, which means a lot of decay. I have a picture of this and it's amazing how much decay you create. 
Here's one we don't talk about very much, but sun scald, you let in a lot of sunlight in a tree that's never seen sunlight in the interior, you create a tremendous amount of injury due to sun scald. You have a lot of rapid regrowth because remember the tree has a signal sent to it that something's happened. Somebody's cut the tree's head off basically. So what is, what's the response? It tries to regrow as many limbs as quickly as possible and that's soft growth and they tend to fail. And it just destroys the natural form. Those are all good reasons never to top a tree. And this is a London plane tree, a picture of the tree. This is a rather large limb that was topped here. Well, here's what a top limb looks like five years down the road on certain species. You get a column of rot that goes down two, three feet into that, and that's just a tremendous injury for the tree that will never recover under normal circumstances. Just another reason not to try not to top a tree. If a tree's put in the wrong location, it's, it's unfortunate, but it may be easier just to pick a tree that's more suited to a specific location rather than dealing with these situations like this and having to top a tree and, and deal with growth that's dangerous, regrowth that's dangerous. Uh, poor planting here, just an example of trees that were, had to be removed and young trees put in there. Uh, this is something most homeowners don't have to worry about, but I wanted to put this in today any which way, is uh, talk just a second about you have to be extremely cautious when there's power lines overhead. Do your research, uh, know what the, the ultimate height of that tree, the mature potential height is going to be before trees go in. If it's under a power line, I'll look for the smallest mature height tree I can find in most situations. A little bit about young tree pruning. pruning. We talked a little bit about the first three years of pruning, but uh, my thinking process for young trees is I identify and reduce or remove super dominant branches. I'm just trying to tip back or shape the tree a little bit. Most trees, if they're a central leader tree by nature, I prune and leave one central leader. The red maple is a good example of that. And then when it's one to three years old, closer to three years old for this last point is I identify the lowest permanent scalpel branches and I, and I prune those in such a way that I want to expose those to the sun. I don't want them shaded or they won't do well. Um, but I set all of those in the first three years. These three things here, dominant branches, Central leader, I set that in the first year. And the last one I'll set in the first three years, the last one. Just a, just a word or two about evergreens. Uh, for the leafy evergreens like magnolias and things, magnolias are a little bit more specific. That's not a real good example, but for the, for the leafy magnolias, the, the evergreen, rather the leafy evergreens, you can prune those just about any time unless there's blooms involved and we can talk about that later. But with pines, um, I break down the evergreens um, into two different types, ones that have coral branches and ones that have random branching. But uh, with something like a white pine, you'll have a candle that grows in the springtime. And if the white pine's growing well, that may be that candle, maybe eight, 10 inches long. This is a slower growing species with a smaller candle. But if for some reason you wanna shape up a evergreen, let's say a white pine, you would do that when the candles start to come out and emerge, but prior to the needles getting fully expanded. And then for the central leader of something like a white pine, you can remove a quarter of that for central leader and up to a half to a third of all the side branches. But it's not as common for us to have to prune things like pine trees because they have a strong dominant natural shape that I don't really want to mess with. A general, a uh, couple general tips to slow the growth for a dwarfing effect for pines, prune after each kind of flush of growth and never prune in late summer. This goes for evergreens or deciduous trees. You don't want to prune any later than late summer because a lot of times a tree's response or shrub's response will be to send out shoots and that will not harden off before winter and what ends up usually happening is that gets killed in winter. When not to prune evergreens is when the branches are frozen, obviously that'll do a lot of damage to the tree. If you have pruners and you're pruning when the wood's frozen, it does a lot of damage. Certain periods of disease, if the tree is diseased, you'll wanna work with uh, someone that can identify that disease or insect problem for you. Those are times not to prune any tree. Uh, swinging back around to the bleeders, uh, when not to prune, maples, elms, birch trees, they are all considered trees that so-called bleed. If you prune those early spring, what you can do for those trees is prune after June the 1st. Uh, just a summary of uh, general tree pruning. Remove all the dead wood, remove broken wood, any branches that are crossing or unsound, 
and then any branches that you don't think looks nice. That's sort of my thinking process summarized for trees. Getting in more of the, the, the fun stuff here very quickly uh, is pruning shrubs. Now remember, a lot of the same principles we talked about with trees uh, also goes for shrubs. And we'll get into pruning by bloom a little bit more on the shrubs. But pruning by bloom, whatever I say for shrubs, typically goes for trees as well if it's a tree that's valued for blooms. Some goals of pruning shrubs. Uh, the thing to remember that some folks like a more informal a more informal prune shrub, it takes a little bit more effort, but after you prune a shrub, it doesn't have to look like it's sheer. It can have a more informal shape, it just takes more time. Pruning cuts don't have to be visible if you locate them on the inside of a plant. If it's something like a boxwood and you're hand pruning that, you may be doing thinning cuts down into the tree to thin that a little bit and bring the overall size down. It takes a lot of time, I'm not gonna lie. I don't see it done very often, but that's possible to leave something like even a boxwood in its natural shape and and keep it small. Now, what most of us do is take a shortcut and we just shear the plant. But when to prune, this is the most common question of any pruning question I get throughout the year. When to prune based on bloom times. The thing to remember is that with summer flowering plants, and that's by that I mean plants that flower after June the 1st, you prune when those plants are dormant because, this is important, because these flower on the current season's growth. So once again, summer flowering plants, ones that flower after June the 1st, you prune in late winter or early spring before they set those buds. Examples would be roses, that includes knockout roses, folks. Abelius hibiscus, there's a whole list of plants you can get from your extension office of summer flowering plants, and we prune those based on bloom time. Now, spring flowering plants, that's plants that flower early before June 1st. You prune after flowering, and before next year's buds are set. So if it's an early flowering plant, you prune right after it flowers, because if you prune before in early spring on a spring flowering plant, you're cutting the blooms off. Examples are things like azaleas, dogwoods, magnolias, all of those fall into that category. So everything's based on bloom time, that June the 1st, that magic June the 1st date for early or late blooming plants. So, and I, I can't remember all the early and late blooming plants, but I can quickly look it up to see when the average bloom time is, and that automatically tells me the best time to prune that plant, whether it's a tree bloomer or a shrub bloomer. Uh, a little bit about pruning, more about pruning shrubs. Uh, when I start to look at a shrub to decide what I'm gonna prune, remove all dead, diseased, and injured branches. And once again, just like trees, all branches that cross or touch one another. A little bit about a proper pruning cut would be here. It's not at too severe of an anchor, it's an angle, it's at a 45 degree angle. The cut is not made too close to the bud. Here's some improperly incorrect pruning cuts on a shrub if you're pruning individual branches. This is too angular. It has to hit a, the shrub has too much surface area to heal. This is too low because you've probably damaged the bud there. We don't want that, that's undesirable. And here you've left too much of a stub here. That's too high, that's gonna die back to a living point. In this case, you're gonna have rotten decay back to a living point, which is a bud. If we're lucky, the rotten decay will stop there at a living point, which is the bud, or it may continue on down. This is the correct pruning cut for shrubs, is um, just a little bit above a bud, not right on top of the bud, with an angle that's about 45 degrees for most cuts. And always cut to a bud that's facing a direction that you want. If I want a limb to grow this direction, I'll cut back to this bud. If I wanted the limb to grow this direction in the future, I would cut on down to the bud that's facing to the left here. So prune to a bud that faces the direction that you want a future limb, just remember that. Two different ways of pruning shrubs that has a drastic effect on shrubs. There's thinning and heading back. Thinning is the complete removal of branches back to a lateral branch, or in some cases for like plants like lilacs, it's all the way to the ground. That's a thinning cut. And it gives plants a more open appearance and heading back cuts, I gave an example earlier, heading back cuts would be shearing. It's, uh, in some cases it can be a little bit more selective than shearing, but it's cutting back to the terminal end of twigs, back to a side bud or no. Always prune to a living point and it produces a denser shrub. Heading back produces dense shrubs, Thinning gives more of an open appearance, and I have a couple slides on this. Here's thinning. You're taking limbs all the way back to more major growing points, and in heading back, you're removing these limbs back to buds. 
and the ultimate effect looks something like this. Here's heading back, a tree that is headed back is dense. A tree that is thin, where the limbs are removed, removed all the way back to a major growing point, not a bud, they end up looking like this. So this is a really important concept with pruning shrubs and trees really, is there's two major styles for me. There's heading back and thinning. Heading back more dense, thinning is a more open shrub. You have to decide some shrubs do better with one style over the other or have more functional value one style over the other. If I was pruning something like a hemlock, it's a tree that can be pruned open, a little bit more open, somewhat more open, or it can be headed back to produce like a hedge. If I wanted it for a hedge, I would prune it using heading back cuts versus thinning. A little bit about rejuvenation of shrubs. Now this is sort of drastic. It's a drastic method of pruning old shrubs that have become too large and it's pretty common. And some shrubs, I said, I mentioned lilac earlier, some shrubs need to undergo this process about every year where you're removing the oldest um, branches here or the oldest limbs. Now, if you have an old shrub that you inherit or purchase a new home that has shrubs that respond well to rejuvenation, not all shrubs do, but a lot, a lot actually do respond well to rejuvenation. Don't do it all in one year. It takes three to four years to rejuvenate a shrub. You remove about a third or a quarter of the largest branches each year and you should be completed by year three or four. You're always removing the oldest largest. And plants that do really well with this process are certain types of dogwood. You got to know which type of dogwood, whether it's a, there's a big difference between the tree form dogwood and a, and a red twig dogwood, things like that. Most of the spireas do well, honeysuckles, hydrangeas, forsythia does well. Uh, all the plants on that list, lilacs, they all do well with rejuvenation pruning something common that I run into a lot working with uh, homeowners. A little, a few rejuvenation considerations, spring flowering shrubs won't bloom that year. You haven't killed the plant probably, but it will not typically bloom. A lot of plants won't if you've started the rejuvenation process. And check the base of shrubs and remove, this is important and we often overlook it, remove any weed blocking fabric. Let's say you have a forsythia or lilac in your landscape and you're rejuvenating it. Well, your rejuvenation branches that are gonna come out of the ground can't do that if those are a heavy weed blocking fabric. So you need to make sure to pull all of that back when you start the rejuvenation process. And if you have specific cultivars, make sure that it's not budded or grafted, or you can easily destroy, destroy the cultivar of the plant and have that old unimproved rootstock growing something that you don't want. Uh, just a couple words about pruning tools, and this also makes a big deal. Um, Hand pruners, we'll start with that. There's the anvil type that's here. It's basically a blade that comes down against a flat surface. I use anvil pruners primarily for dead wood because an anvil pruner has a smashing effect. And now I don't care if my dead branches on a knockout rose get smashed. I don't care about that injury and they, they're very effective on dead hard wood. But if I have living tissue, I wanna use bypass pruners where this blade bypass bypasses the bottom portion of the pruner here. This blade bypasses. So there's two major types of pruners and they're very different. Anvil pruners and bypass pruners. Anvil pruners for dead wood and bypass pruners for all the living wood. Now for the most part I'm using bypass pruners 80-90% of the time. When I have a lot of dead in a plant I bring out my anvil pruners. But they're for two different situations and they're not really interchangeable to me. The two anvil pruners here and the uh, bypass pruners are really different tools. They really are. Here's just a better picture of a uh, bypass pruner along with a, a pruning saw. Two things to me make this a pruning saw. The first thing is that that's a very narrow blade here. I can really get that in when I'm pruning shrubs especially. That's the first thing that makes it a pruning saw. The second thing is that it's a double cut saw meaning it, it cuts green wood very well on the push and pull. A lot of standard hand saws only cut on the push or pull. They don't cut both ways. Pruning saws cut, they're called a push-pull saw because they, they cut very quickly green wood on the push and pull, so remember that. It's a nice fine blade here. It's not very wide. You can get it in tight angles and do a good job pruning shrubs that may have a lot of branches. Here's loppers. It's a classic lopper here that's got these big long uh, handles. 
I've seen some more improved loppers uh, at hardware stores here lately that'll say force multiplying loppers. They'll say three by force multiplying, four by uh, force multiplying, where they have a gear right here, an extra gear. And you'll find these loppers that may have little short handles. You may be tempted to buy these big loppers, but if you see force multiplying loppers that says four by force multiplying, and you see that they have a little gear here and they have short handles, purchase those. I encourage you to try those out because they will make you feel really strong because they do multiply your force and they will actually be more effective than these big long loppers because they use a gear to make you uh, much stronger to actually multiply the force that you're applying. I really love those. I don't think I own a pair of these long handled loppers anymore because they're so unhandy in a tight situation. I really like the force, the force multipliers a lot better and they're getting to be very common. The, the, ones with the gears in this area. Uh, pole saws have two components. They have a pruning saw here for larger limbs. And then they have usually what's a bypass pruner. I've never seen a pole saw with an anvil pruner. I usually see pole saws with a, a good set of bypass pruners. So you can cut big limbs or smaller limbs are designed for both. And chainsaws, most of you guys will never have an occasion to buy a pruning saw, but you'll see professional landscapers and arborists, they use these tiny little stubby saws that look almost like toys, but they're small, powerful saws that they can get into tight um, places on either, a, in this case, it's a tree that you would use this saw on. They can carry those safely with them. They're lighter. They can get into tight spaces. A little bit about pruning tools. 